Good morning or afternoon or evening. Yes, it's that time again. This is Chef Jack with Culinary Sustainability 118. And this week we're talking about food animal production, chapter 12. We've touched on some of these topics before, but today we're going to take a little bit deeper dive into the subject. Let's go. So first we'll go through the learning objectives. I'll just briefly touch on them. Describe prevailing approach to food animal production in the US. Summarize major trends in food animal production. Give some examples of what drove industrialization of food animal production. And notice, you know, we're saying food animal production. We used to call them farms. In some ways we still do. In some ways how animals are produced is more just almost assembly line. Describe some of the public health, social, environmental, and animal welfare impacts associated with industrial food animal production. Compare some of the industrial versus the agroecological approaches to food and animal production. Discuss policy and some other interventions aimed at addressing some of the impacts associated with industrial food animal production, or IFAP. So just touching a little bit on the history, you know, most farm animals were first domesticated a little bit more than 8,000 years ago. It's been a slow evolution since then. And prior to the 1930s, especially, you know, poultry, swine, cattle, were all raised on small scale, independently owned farms. And a lot of times they were, one farm would grow any or all of those breeds and different species. Farms were more diversified, they had mixed crops, animals, and the animals and, you know, they worked in complementary ways. I've talked about that before, you know, the, you know, the cows will go through and then the chickens will kind of come through and eat manure or actually the larva of the bugs that's in the manure, you know, keep the population of insects down on the farm or flies. So they kind of helped one another when you actually have them working together. You know, after the 30s or specialization, you know, aims at increasing efficiency by narrowing the range of tasks or roles involved in production, kind of breaking it down into individual tasks. And instead of having multiple breeds of animals, they would have just one. Instead of having not only just one species, they would have just one breed. And that really you know, makes things more uniform. So much of what we eat and see in food today, it's it's all consistent. It's always the same looking. Whereas in nature, it's always a little bit different. So a lot of the breeders, you know, they use one breed of animal because it was all the same shape, size, organization increased. And with that, you know, if things are more similar in size or shape, it's easier for the equipment to harvest stuff. And we're talking meat here, but if you think of like apples, or grapes and stuff, if they could have things more uniform, they could just have one machine go right down the row. But if you had different sizes and shapes of grapes and vines, then you, it wouldn't fit into them. And there was much more genetic diversity and that decreased as we became more specialized, industrialized. Industrial food animal production, here's a link. So this is just kind of a quick summary of raising, raising animals in industrial food system and this really covers a lot that we talk about in the book and it's kind of a nice ready reference or if you want to share some information with other students or chefs or just people this is a nice little an approach to meat dairy and egg production characterized by specialized operations designed for a high rate production large number of animals confined at high density large quantities of localized animal waste. And along with that, there's substantial inputs, financial capital, fossil fuels, feed, pharmaceuticals, indirect inputs, what it takes to produce all that feed, all the water and f fuel that we've talked about before, really starts to have a large impact on our environment. Industrial food animal production, IFAP, predominant approach to the meat dairy. Nine billion farm animals slaughtered each year just in the U.S. Just think about that, how many animals are produced. We eat a fair amount of them, but then some of those, the meat gets sold around the world. Increased with it, though, there's been an increased availability and ability of animal products in the U.S. And that's always been the conundrum. It's available and it's cheaper so people always look at that fact. They don't look at the downside, the other factors that lead up to more availability and cheap animal products. Most of this is out of sight of the public. I think that's what you know we forget. When's the last time you really saw how and where 
our animals were raised or even slaughtered. And I put this in here, slaughterhouse with a view. Places now I know in Minnesota and in Vermont and other places where these fl slaughterhouses, not on industrial ones, but more local ones that We'll sell at local meat markets and such. We're starting to put in a viewing area so that if people want to go there, they can view how the animals are being slaughtered and how they're being treated before and after slaughter. So it kind of puts the workers on notice, but it also brings it to real life people eating it. I mean, this, you know, we always just see that nice little package of meat in the refrigerator that meat was a living, breathing animal. So then industrial food animal production, low prices due to industrialization, plus a lot of the crops that are fed the animals are federally subsidized. So our taxpayer money subsidizes some of these big egg companies or farms. On the one hand, yeah, the cheap meat is a little bit cheaper, but in some ways we've paid for it through our federal taxes to make that meat cheaper. So is it really cheaper? Um, weak enforcement environmental regulations, you can see touched on some of, you know, there's different states have lax or more lenient regulations. Confinement areas impact local air, water, and soil quality. Tax incentives, certain states like some of those big operations because they also do provide some jobs. Research investment, a lot of ma major universities get money to force or perpetuate the industrial food system. Expanded infrastructure, externalization of costs. And the, again, I think the book talked about this. Some of the manure and whatnot contaminate local streams or air quality. And then there's a cleanup. That cost is not in the price of the meat that we buy. It's, it's either not, never captured or it's paid for in some other manner cost to others, public health, the rural communities, environment. thing that people are starting to become more aware of is farm animal welfare concerns. Until recently, animal welfare assured by the farmer self-interest because you wanted to preserve and keep that animal because it not only provided a workforce for you, it sustains yourself and your family and others. Inherent interest in protect the welfare of the animal. Industrial food animal production. Technology enables putting animals in environments where they suffer. Because normally if you put an animal in a stressed situation, do well, they don't thrive. Ultimately could die. Some of the technology like growth hormones and antibiotics, they're able to the animals be in those situations. A couple of examples the book talked about were laying hens, six or more in a tiny wire cage, some standing on others, they can't stretch their wings, a lot of them are de-beaked so they don't peck or kill at one another. And here's a picture of an old style, eight chickens in each of these little pens, basically just eat, poop, and lay an egg, and that's all they do day in and day out for all of their lives. And that's why people are trying to get away from, and you're seeing more cage-free or, or free-range chickens where they're more out and about instead of in this living condition. Farm animal welfare concerns continued. We look at dairy cows. They used to produce five to six hundred pounds of milk in 1957. So, I mean, that's about you know, a pound of milk, or not a pound of milk, a gallon of milk is about eight pounds. Let's probably do the math, but what, 70 gallons? 70, yeah, about that. <laughs> and then, you know, today, some of those animals are producing 21,000 pounds during their lactation cycle. So, I mean, it's just a phenomenal difference between that, you know, and that happened in just, you know, 60 years. With that, there's been some other issues. It's estimated that 30% of the U.S. dairy herd is lame. There are serious reproductive problems and mastitis. And I think this was interesting, and I did a study with the UW-Madison in the state of Wisconsin, and I was talking to some farmers, a lot of grass-based farmers and some, you know, more industrial farmers. The average age of how that produces this much milk is about three years. And after that, their, you know, their livers and other organs are pretty much shot, whereas a grass-based cow can live 10 to 20 years. So I guess I never thought about it. I was just think, as I was talking about it right now for this video, it's like, okay, so in three years they can produce that. So that's about 7,000 pounds a year versus if you, if they produce that for say 15 years, is it similar? And actually someone with their phone, quick whip that out with the phone. But I mean, sometimes, you know, we look at that, it's like, wow, this is great, but those animals only live that. And if you ever notice in and around Milwaukee, you'll see these trucks not so much because one of the processing plants down by Potawatomi is gone now. You always used to see these cows being brought in on these big trucks and finished dairy cows that were just being going in to be slaughtered down at the meatpacking plant. And a lot of them get their tails docked 
without anesthesia. Mastitis is, is a severe problem with the industrial cows. But I know with grass-based farmers, when I was talking with this group, they had virtually no mastitis. You know, they started out over a f- course of 50 years, you know, it was no problem. And then, you know, like mastitis pops up. So I sometimes, you know, I try to reinforce this through this class. It's like, you know, sometimes we think we've got a good idea and we, it is for a while. Then all of a sudden little problems crop up. And then at some point we've got to take a step back and say, what's going on here? And is this the right way of doing things? So that's just, I hope, you know, so that was just one of those cases where, so this is a feed cattle. We've seen this picture before. I like the barbed wire here. I think, is that to keep the cows in or the people out? Don't know. An interesting thing is, I mean, this is just thousands upon thousands of animals. They're raised on grass, probably 12 to 15 months. Now they're finished in these feedlots where they get just corn and soybeans to fatten them up. And again, 30 years ago, they used to put them in these feedlots for 30 days and then slaughter them. Well, then it went up to 60 days and then 90 days. And now it's pretty common. You see 120 to 150 days on these feedlots. Corn and soybean is so cheap. Each day they get more and more fat on them, which is then they can get more and more money for them. But an interesting thing with the feedlot is now we've got the E. coli situation with a lot of ground beef. Again, it was part of this study that as Madison, you know, I learned that, you know, as animals transition to these feedlots, the acidity level in their stomach changes. Normally, you just think if you if you're feeling good, you know your your stomach acid can kill off a lot of things that enter it. Now, in this base, this high carbohydrate diet, their acidity in their stomach actually goes up a little bit. Acidosis, and one don't feel all that great. Two, it allowed some E. coli to be able to get through from the manure through their system. Some of those strains of E. coli now is what makes people sick. So we've set up this environment over time again where all of a sudden the cow naturally killed, destroyed the E. coli, but now with their upset stomachs, this some of the E. coli can get through and then now that that's what gets people sick. Again, that didn't happen 40 years ago. All of a sudden, you know, that started happening 10, 15 years ago, and people didn't put it together until now. They're starting to see. There was some discussion about maybe taking animals off feedlots for the last 10 days to let their stomachs neutralize and slaughter them. Broilers, again, 9 billion animals slaughtered. Pick up twice the weight with half the feed, product of industrialization. So we saw the laying hens before, and now here's the meat birds otherwise called broilers, and they're just, you know, one of these barns, tents, whatever you want to call it, will hold maybe 50,000 birds, and they do the same with turkeys. Pregnant sows, you know, they're not able to turn or walk around, develop food and leg problems. Basically, they just on concrete all their life. Now people are trying to change the density of how and where the animals are raised. I know I talked to some farmers and, you know, some ways pigs are very destructive. They they really do like to root around. You know, if a farmer had some invasive species or some areas that he wanted to clear out or turn over, he would just fence it off, put some five or six pigs in there, then the whole area would just get turned over. So that one, it would keep the invasive species out, and then two, and the the pigs would fertilize it. You know, again, it's just an example of how farm animals, you know, there's more, many uses for them other than just meat. This is how the pigs are raised and that's just where they are. They get fed there. And you can imagine the amount of stress that's on these animals. I think this is a great place to take a little pause, take a break, stand up and stretch and get ready for video two with Chef Jack.